And Professor, I do want you to break down Russia's response to this. They called U.S. drone flights, quote, a provocation. And the Russian ambassador said this, the unacceptable activity of the U.S. military in close proximity to our borders is a cause for concern. What do you make of their response? Well, it's predictable. Uh, the, you know, the American position is uh, what we were doing is perfectly legal under international law. We were in international airspace, uh, not within Russian airspace. But at the same time, from the Russian point of view, they've got a war going on and we're flying military aircraft very close to their airspace uh, in a way that is designed to help their enemy uh, defeat them. So uh, it's understandable that they try to point out that uh, we're operating very close to them so that other countries may say, well, we can we can understand how you feel. Uh, so it's their way of protesting and saying what we're doing is unreasonable, even if it's not illegal. Sure. And broadly speaking, what do you think is next for U.S. Russia relations? Where do we go from here? Big question. Uh, the overall question uh, being, how is the war in Ukraine uh, going to evolve? Uh, will it remain a stalemate? Will either side uh, uh, come closer to defeating the other? And what can the United States do about it? Excuse me. And there's really no good answer to those questions because uh, you can see a path to any of those three outcomes, depending on particular decisions about policy in Moscow and Washington and and uh, Kiev, uh, and also the uh, physical capacities of both sides. Uh, there's an open question now about whether the uh, United States and its uh, friends who are supporting Ukraine have the production capacity to keep Ukraine supplied with the munitions it needs. Similarly, the Russians are running into logistical and supply problems. Uh, if either side fixes those problems better than the other side does and begins to uh, push the other side back consistently, then the question of what's next will have a different answer. Uh, if we have a stalemate for another year, then the odds grow that there will be more and more pressure for a truce of some sort uh, and a negotiation aimed at a settlement. Uh, there's no apparent movement towards that at the moment because people on this side have hopes for a spring counteroffensive uh, a little later uh, in coming months. Uh, and the Russians uh, have hopes for taking Bakhmut. Uh, so both sides think they still might uh, uh, start doing a lot better within the near future. And as long as that's true, uh, there's probably not much diplomacy can do uh, to shorten the war, uh, apart from uh, trying to support one side uh, uh, coming out uh, on top of the other. Professor, you mentioned the word truce, a potential truce within the next year. This upcoming year is an election year. Do you think that changes the balance in any way? Well, uh, nothing's ever irrelevant to an election. And the, the issue of American support for Ukraine has become uh, more of an issue in the sense that there is resistance among some Republicans, especially to uh, expending American resources and continuing to support Ukraine. Uh, the big question there is whether that resistance or opposition will grow. If it doesn't grow, it can probably be contained and American support will continue. And if it's feasible, uh, technically and, and managerially to accelerate it, that, that will probably happen too. Uh, as far as the election politics of it go, uh, the the best thing uh, for the Biden administration, of course, would be for the Ukrainians to start winning and to be able to say American support has been worth it because uh, justice is is on the way. Uh, if the stalemate continues, then uh, the anti-support opposition uh, may well grow 
and it could become a bigger issue in the election. Professor Richard Betts, I appreciate your insights. Thank you for coming on. You're welcome.